<laughs> so it's, that says it all. That's yes. right. Yeah, really. That's right. So I guess I'm done. Look at him. He's like, so cute. Uh, that's great. Just learned how to clap. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, it's so, it, it's, uh, it's an honor to have the chance to contribute to the dialogue that we're all having today. Uh, I'm sad that I had to miss uh, the sessions today uh, and uh, tomorrow, but based on my experience participating in past IQ Extension seminars, uh, I know the impact that these kinds of conversations can have, uh, and I'm thrilled to be a part of this. So thank you for having me and letting me extend whatever my part uh, and my experiences are into uh, the space that, that you're all sharing. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, kind of three things. So the first thing that uh, I'm going to talk about is my relationship to uh, Don Levine Sensei, how we met, how our relationship developed, what our relationship meant to me, and how mm -hmm. I think his spirit and legacy uh, live on in, in a variety of ways uh, uh, through, through me and his former students and perhaps many of you as well, uh, certainly many of you as well. Um, the second thing that I'd like to uh, discuss is um, uh, IQ extensions and how I've gotten to know IQ, IQ extensions, but specifically uh, a singular moment in time in 2013 when uh, Don presented a framework um, for uh, O Sensei's, uh, Don's interpretation of O Sensei's mature vision of Aikido. So, how O Sensei was thinking about uh, IQ principles late in his life uh, and um, how interestingly uh, those principles seem to blossom within Don's uh, being as well in his final years. Um, and then the, the third thing that I'd like to talk about um, is, you know, I, I think each of us in this room is part of IQ Extensions because we believe in its mission to apply IQ principles in everyday life. Um, and the, the beautiful thing, one of the beautiful things I think about Aikido and its philosophy, uh, and Osensei's philosophy, is that it's about something bigger than uh, a martial art. It's about something bigger than uh, self-defense and the ability to, you know, fend off an attacker in a parking garage. Uh, it's uh, it's about uh, something that reaches at, at the level of soul, at the level of heart, at the level of the universe, at the level of how we're all interconnected, and. Um, and so I think that those that that kind of moral underpinning almost to, to Aikido is um, manifested through the social change that each of us makes in a daily on a daily basis in our own lives, whether that's through filmmaking, through writing, through the office job that we hold and the impact we have on our colleagues or uh, or it, the people we work with, uh, the impact we have on our families, the and maybe the impact we have in. Uh, in our dojo, in, in all of the work that we do, social change is present, however big, however small. And so as social change agents uh, that each of us are, the, uh, these four principles that Don interpreted from O Sensei's uh, last years, uh, I think are especially relevant. Uh, and I'm gonna highlight a few examples of how these principles become extremely practical when you're trying to create change. And I'll draw upon my experiences uh, building and scaling uh, an organization from an idea on a college campus to 30 cities nationwide and a uh, $2 million budget over eight years. Um, so does that sound okay? And then we can have sort of a conversation. All right. Um, so a uh, little bit on my relationship with Dawn. Um, in 2010, I spent the summer in China, uh, in short, interning for a company that turned out to be very corrupt, um, and uh, uh, absorbing into my body a variety of diseases, um, ranging from bronchitis to pneumonia to mononucleosis to uh, sinusitis, and it got worse and worse and worse. So basically over the course of four months, I was going to work each day, working for a company that I w every day was realizing I had been duped into working for. It, was, it had a social mission, but it turned out to be an incredibly corrupt organization. And then uh, at night, I would go home and cough all night. 
uh, and it would get worse and worse over the course of the summer to where by, by September of 2010, I was completely, I just felt completely broken. Uh, and I was away from friends, I was away from family, it was the first time I was really living on my own, uh, away from anybody I was close to, I felt incredibly alone. Uh, and you know, everybody has their own sort of rock bottom. I've hit worse since then. I'm sure I'll hit much worse in the future. Um, but for someone who grew up in a privileged household, uh, I was on another continent, had lost everything that I felt, my physical health, my friends, uh, and my sense of kind of moral guidance in the world. Uh, and I was looking for something to hang on to. So I was returning to school that autumn uh, and I heard about a course in the course catalog at the University of Chicago that seemed uh, on paper to be a really easy course. And it was called Conflict Theory Aikido. And the professor was Don Levine. And the description said, you'll learn about all types of conflicts and then you'll go to the gym and play around on the mats. Basically, that's how that was my interpretation, and I thought, wow, this sounds like an easy break, uh, great way for me to ease back into school, you know, with mononucleosis, having to sleep 12 hours a night. Um, and I, I show up for the class, and uh, it it wasn't easy. Everything about it challenged everything I, I had come to believe. Uh, you know, growing up in hyper masculinized sports teams and fraternity life, uh, in you know, watching the news in the 1990s and 2000s and, and thinking that everybody's at war and this is just the way it has to be and um, feeling disillusioned about any, any kind of voice that I as a millennial could have in the world. Uh, you know, and then, I, and then I go to this class and everything is flipped upside down. And we're studying Gandhi, we're studying O Sensei, we're studying Martin Luther King Jr., we're studying Walt, uh, uh, Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and everything is getting turned on its head. And, and it, it was an incredibly difficult course, philosophically, to stomach. Um, but uh, what made it so palatable was that Don was teaching it. Uh, and over the course of this 10-week uh, experience, uh, my entire worldview changed. Uh, and we would do Aikido twice a week and tie it to real-world concepts. Family, uh, I mean, the kinds of things that, that we're all talking about today and tomorrow here. Uh, so. At the end of the course, Don uh, invited his students at, of the university who were participating to join his private dojo two nights a week, which he was doing ongoing anyway, uh, kind of on a permanent basis at the University of Chicago Hyde Park Aikido Club. And uh, I was one of, not surprisingly probably to many of you, one of few students who actually took him up on the opportunity, and really one of only two students who actually stuck with it uh, after the first couple of sessions, uh, but you know it had just it had sunk in, and and you know that feeling when you, you've got the bug, uh, and so I kept going, and uh, very shortly thereafter, uh, Don asked me to uh, be his assistant for business matters that he was working on, uh, and so that was my job three days a week. Uh, I continued to seek out Don's help on thesis advice and other kinds of studies that I was doing at the University of Chicago. So we developed a very close working relationship on the mat uh, as students and sensei, uh, as you know, he was my professor in the classroom, but then really off the mat as well uh, as a mentor because uh, I was interested in issues of social change and he had founded IP Extensions. He had worked on hun probably hundreds, at least dozens of asylum cases for refugees. He had uh, uh, he had participated in revolutions, he had advised government leaders. I mean, he knew social change in, inside and out, and that was his area of study academically too, uh, social theory and social change. Um, and then finally, over the course of several years, we actually became friends. Uh, we transcended this uh, initial barrier between sensei and student, or mentor and mentee, or uh, old guy and young guy. Uh, and and became buddies, uh, and we would get together for scotch and coffee and uh, croissants on Sunday mornings, and we would trade book recommendations, and uh, and you know I'd play with his grandkids, and uh, uh, eventually in 2015, when he was in the later stages of his cancer, um, uh, my son was born premature, uh, about a month premature. His due date was going to be April 12th, 2015, uh, and Don was 
basically on his deathbed at the time, uh, and uh, Maximilian came on March 22nd. Uh, and uh, so Don actually got to uh, meet Maximilian over video. Uh, we were in Germany at the time for immigration reasons, but he got to meet Maximilian over video, and um, actually Maximilian's middle name is Don. Uh, mm -hmm. And then on April 5th uh, of last year, Don passed away. And so it was almost, there was something cosmic going on uh, to say, hey, this baby needs to be born a month early uh, so that he can meet the guy that he's named after. Um, so we had a very, very close relationship. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the most powerful moments in our relationship where I learned from Don, and it's continued to really influence the way I think about the world and, and Aikido is, um, when we went to the Aiki Extensions uh, European Seminar in 2013, uh, where many familiar faces were there. Uh, and that was my first, uh, uh, I'd say, immersive uh, interaction with Aiki Extensions. Um, and Don uh, was invited to give the keynote that year. Uh, and the, the uh, interesting thing about 2013 was it was Kind of the hundredth anniversary of, of the, the World War One, uh, and so there's this question of, okay, the Great War, the first time that mass killing at that scale had been enabled in any kind of way by technology <clears throat> or whatever. A hundred years had passed, and what, how is Aikido relevant to that this conversation? And so I was I was working with Don a lot on the speech in the weeks leading up to. Uh, our, our flight to Frankfurt, uh, where we sat together and talked on the plane, and um, that was one of the, the themes, but he kept reading into the history of Osensei and the history of Osensei and reading biography after biography and trying to find primary sources, and um, he came to develop this understanding of how Osensei was thinking about Aikido in his latter years. Uh, and. Uh, he titled, Don titled this talk, um, uh, paraphrased, uh, Moving Beyond uh, Aikido as the Japanese Martial Art of Self-Defense into the Universal Practice of Peace. And he broke this down and he said, you know, it's not, it, you know, even though it's from Japanese and there are Japanese terms and there were Japanese practitioners that founded it, it's really based in like a very comprehensive general Eastern tradition. And then he broke down martial, and he said, "Well, it's kind of martial, but really, it's much, there's a lot more to it than, than you know militant uh, underpinnings." And then he broke it down and said, "Well, yes, it's it's an art, uh, but it goes beyond art, and there's there there are scientific elements to it as well, and it's more than that, and and it's a practice." Uh, and he kept going on and on to where it's the universal practice of peace. And then he said, well, "So the four ways that the universal practice of peace needs to be applied." Uh, go beyond what we in mainstream Aikido tend to think of Aikido as. Uh, and he, he believed before he gave the talk that it would be received in a controversial way. And I, I don't know, I, I didn't have a chance to debrief with uh, that many of the, the people in attendance, um, so maybe that's something for discussion, but uh, the, there were a couple of elements of this framework that he thought would be controversial, and the framework goes as such. He said that Aikido really should be practiced through, through four pillars. Uh, the first is reflexive Aikido. So we shouldn't just go onto the mat, and just, you know, disclaimer and reminder, I'm second cue. I, I, you guys have been, most of you have probably been training way longer than I have, um, and uh, I'm, I'm no Aikido expert, so I'm just the messenger. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, um, it, this, this resonated a lot with me beyond what's on the mat um, in my experience. So the, the first was reflexive Aikido, where we don't just go onto the mat and interact and uh, interact in mainly silence uh, and then take no time afterward to discuss uh, or to write down or to think about that fringe thought, that fleeting moment where something clicked uh, and, and we shouldn't just leave it at, you know, beers after the day at the Aikido seminar where we kind of 
talk through a few things, but but don't really apply any sense of discipline or rigor to what we're learning and building and accumulating uh, together. But that you know, if you, if this is really a journey, you have to take the time and the effort and the discipline to a apply off the mat reflexively the kind of thought that you're putting into every single reflex and moment on the mat. Um, the second, which I think is the most familiar to everybody, is receptive Aikido. And the idea is it's receptive. You're receiving. Uh, and so when an attack comes at you, you receive the attack and you create space and you welcome the attacker and you uh, uh, and, and you do your best not to cause pain. Uh, and that kind of receiving uh, is what uh, enables you to turn an attack into something more constructive or positive. Um, so I think that makes sense to everybody. The third, which is what he thought, uh, he, he really wondered how it would be received, but he be believed deeply that Osensei thought this at the core of his being, was projective Aikido. So this idea that are you know are we are we just receiving attacks all the time in daily life? Is it just a series of things that are happening to us, and we're just the recipient, or do we ever have the agency to take pause and take a step back and conceive of a problem that we want to solve that matters to us for whatever reason, and actually form a plan of attack and be be the uke <clears throat> in that sense and actually initiate, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, and so, how do you? How do you pursue projective Aikido in a way where you become the problem solver and you, you're able to attack problems? Uh, and, uh, and it's okay if those problems are just obstacles that, it, that it's your opportunity to upend. Um, and then the, the final pillar was this concept of uh, mediative Aikido. So we spend a lot of time, most of our time, uh, in Keiko one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes we pile on uh, to, to see how much the energy can go through multiple people. And there, there are varieties, I mean, there's uh, randori, and uh, there are a lot of ways to practice, but what about just an intervention where two people or three people are in conflict with one another? In the real world, what is the role of the Aikidoist? Uh, and how do, we, how do we kind of formalize our understanding of what it means to intervene. If you're on the subway in New York and you see two people fighting, what do you do? Uh, I mean, and, and what are the results and what are the consequences? How do you familiarize yourself with that? If you're in a, in, if you're in, a, uh, if you're a parent and you have two kids and two, two of your children and they're angry teenage boys and they're about to punch each other in the face, what do you do? Uh, and do you raise your voice as well? Don thought that, that one of the most effective things experimentally would be if you just walk up to the two people that are fighting and you smile and you center yourself and you just smile. And so one of his students actually did that. Um, uh, Test by, mm -hmm. many of you probably know, was on a subway in New York and two guys were about to duke it out and he didn't know whether they were armed, but he was centered and he walked up and he tried it and he just smiled and they were confused out of their minds. <laughs> like, what is this guy doing smiling next to him? Why is he just standing there? And they looked up and they, they didn't even know what to say and calmed the entire situation down. Uh, and uh, so this concept of mediative Aikido and, and how does that apply in, in the real world? Does that, does that make sense to everybody? So there's reflexive Aikido, receptive Aikido, projective Aikido, and mediative Aikido. So um, after the conference, we went back and continued to build the relationship that I described to you uh, up until Don's di dying day. And uh, all of that I've described as independent of what was going on in the rest of my life uh, from the moment the economy collapsed in 2007, which was that I, my parents grew up in poverty. Uh, they got together and had a single child and decided to ha give that child all the opportunities they never had. Uh, and so they worked hard and saved every penny. Uh, and uh, much to their uh, uh, disgruntlement, I suppose, uh, I kind of squandered that for the first 14 years. I was a total knucklehead. And you know, when you're eight years old, you don't know what you're squandering. So are you really squandering? Who knows? Uh, but 
Uh, I was a terrible student, a troublemaker, all, just always uh, angering my teachers, getting kicked out of class, skateboarding around town, just being being uh, uh, sort of a hooligan. And uh, I have three of those. <laughs> <laughs> you never know how. Yeah, it's hope. Yeah, hope. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot to be said for what video games can teach you, what skateboarding can teach you. Uh, but uh, what can teach you a lot too is a mentor. Uh, and so when I was 14, I failed a math test, and my mom went to the local community college, and uh, she put signs up everywhere saying something like desperate mother seeking tutor for failing son and uh, the, the first guy that responded was this this young man who was 19 from Ghana who had just flown in on a plane ticket with his life savings uh, to pursue what he thought was the American dream because he didn't see opportunity in his own country and he started tutoring me in math and within a year my, I went from being a D minus math student to a B plus math student but the more important thing than the grade was that for the first time I felt a sense of academic self-efficacy and agency and control over the outcomes and my environment and my feelings and my attitude and my time and my, and my own outcomes. And all of a sudden, uh, I, I kind of crawled out of this, this mild depression that I had spent most of middle school in into uh, a, just a sense of hard driving, probably overly hard driving, uh, confidence about, or not con more like determination with feigned confidence uh, about the future uh, and my future and what it meant and how I could make my parents proud as a single child, that's kind of the only thing that I had in mind. Uh, and the, long story short, four years later, I ended up at the University of Chicago on a full ride scholarship, but the, uh, the funny thing that happened uh, in 2007 is that the economy collapsed. And so I get to the University of Chicago to study economics with Nobel laureate professors. Uh, and uh, I'm reading the Wall Street Journal, uh, walking to class and seeing the guys from Lehman Brothers carrying their boxes out of the out of their office buildings, getting laid off and wondering, you know, that's that's interesting. And, uh, and then, you know, I was uh, interning at a bank on the south side of Chicago at the time called Shore Bank that was kind of the first social enterprise, uh, meaning a, a business that's able to uh, help people or help the environment and still make a profit, uh, which at the time was a really novel idea. Um, now there are all kinds of social enterprises, but at, in the 1980s when Shore Bank was founded, it was very, very uh, new. Uh, and I was interning there, and so I would go from my Ivy Deck campus to Shore Bank and see single mothers coming in with the tears streaming down their face because they just lost their house, they'd lost their job, they had multiple kids to feed, they didn't know what to do, and they're living in gang territory. And I'm, and I'm thinking, well, I'm interning at this bank, but I could be doing more because I'm on this campus with all these friends that do nothing with their time in the fraternity, on the swim team, doing all this stuff. And so we started this club called Money Think, and the idea was to take uh, college kids, our friends at first, and recruit them, train them with the help of some faculty, and including, our, including ourselves, and go into local inner city high school classrooms, the toughest schools in Chicago, and just sit down with kids and build a connection on basic stuff like sports, music, like the, just the stuff we had in common. We both watch sports, we both listen to the same uh, rap artists, we both do all these different things, build some common ground, and then start talking about money concepts. We were learning all of this high-flying, economics knowledge, that could probably be a lot more useful to kids who don't have a lot of economic advantages if we could distill it into something that was relevant to them. Uh, and so we did, and it was, it was difficult, and I'm happy to talk war stories, but the, uh, um, the long story short is that we built a curriculum, we built a volunteer base, we expanded it uh, to over the course of time, 30 other campus communities and 60 other high schools across the country, uh, and then uh, raised funding from Wall Street firms, family foundations, billionaires, millionaires, everyday common people that wrote $2, $2 donations on our website, uh, and, and hundreds of these people, thousands of these people, uh, and um, uh, gained you know the kind of exposure, media attention, national acclaim that had uh, together as part of the big picture, 
enabled us to really make a ripple effect uh, at tables where big decisions get made about policy, about uh, funding, about all kinds of things that ultimately influence our students and the communities that we serve. So the reason that that whole story is, is relevant is that the whole time that I was working on that, I was also working with John, and I was also learning about Aikido, and everything that I was learning on the mat was instantly translating uh, indirectly or directly into whatever was happening in conversations about Money Think and the strategy we were pursuing and the donors we were pursuing. So every time I went into a donor meeting, every time I, uh, I sat down with, with our team to work through some burning questions and leadership conflict or whatever, there was always this kind of Ike backdrop that was um, uh, sneakily fusing its way into, into whatever I was feeling or thinking that probably prevented some disaster along the way. Uh, and so the, the thing that I want to posit uh, this evening is how do you take these four um, principles uh, or, or channels that Don interpreted from Osensei and think about the social change you want to make in, uh, in your, your family, your community, your city, your state, this country, uh, through whatever means you have and are best at, how do you take these four principles and apply them? Because I think that they're incredibly relevant upon a lot of reflection. And so in our experience, when you think about reflexive Aikido, on the mat, it means don't leave it just on the mat. Actually take, take it back, write it down, think about it, discuss it. Uh, in social change efforts, it's if, if there's a leadership conflict, if there is uh, a, uh, a, a uh, negotiation with a big donor or a big client, if there is a disgruntled beneficiary uh, that you're trying to serve but things aren't connecting, whatever's happening there, that's, that's the work, that's the geiko of social change. And, it, and it's not enough to just resolve the issue. It, I think it, it takes you know, having a notebook called key decision analysis and taking five minutes every Friday to say, what were the, what were the big things that happened this week and, uh, and how did Aikido play out? How, like, how did my leadership evolve? How did our organization apply IQ principles? And actually thinking about it and logging it. Uh, because the process of logging it actually, I think, sharpens uh, the, uh, the, the thought that, um, that we can then reapply more naturally the next week. Um, it also applies in, in money think in the sense of you know, it's really easy to fudge numbers. It's really easy to say, oh, the kids, it seems like the kids liked it. It seems like the volunteers had a good time. Oh, the teachers that hosted the visit uh, said that it was really cool and it was better than anything they'd ever seen. Well, that's all great feedback, but how do you know that, how do you know what degree of validity that feedback is? Like, same thing, you know, if you're hosting I don't know, an, an Aikido event or uh, a book launch or anything that's, that's relevant, how do you go past just qualitative data? How do you say, what are the metrics that actually tell me whether this was more successful than what happened before? And what are the metrics that actually say whether this is more successful than everything else comparatively that's happening out there? And I know like in, in the space of Aikido and spirituality and somatics, that that's very difficult to do a lot of times because there aren't numbers that you can throw on to like spiritual transformation or you know everything psychological. Um, so I, I don't actually have an answer there, but all I know is that in building an organization, one thing that has helped to get donors and uh, really strong senior leadership team members to join us and actually take a job with us rather than Facebook or Google or whatever has been uh, to hold ourselves to a standard of rigor and be very transparent about the numbers that we're achieving um, and almost treat ourselves like we would treat ourselves if we were a public company, even though we're just a 10-person ten, ten staff nonprofit. Um, the, the second uh, being receptive Aikido, uh, I think is, is probably something that I don't know, need to go into too much detail on because it's the most natural to everybody in the room, but 
things don't always work out. Uh, donors pull out, uh, people try to sue you, employees try to ruin your reputation, uh, former employees, um, uh, board members defect. Uh, leadership is a contact sport. Uh, you know, it, as much as as much as we don't want it, as much as this art exists to, to smooth out those collisions, the collisions still happen. Bloody noses happen. Uh, and some people don't take those bloody noses the right way, especially uh, if you had if, if you couldn't do much about it at the time, because not everything's within your control. Sometimes shitty things happen in the dojo that you weren't in control of, and, mm -hmm. uh, and you know you just have to take it from there. And anytime something like that happens, there's just the question of how do I receive this? How do I create the space? How do I genuinely try to not inflict pain on the person that is mm -hmm. upset? Uh, genuinely, uh, and uh, how do I get this to a point of resolution that helps me, uh, you know, for lack of a better or more appropriate phrase, uh, 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 lose the battle but win the war, um, in a lot of senses. Um, and I, I know ultimately the greatest victory is the victory over oneself, um, but uh, in the in the near term, there's there's more. Um, third. Projective Aikido, so I, I'm just thinking about Aikido extensions. You know, Don was a, an activist at his core from the very beginning. He, when he was 16, he joined, I don't even know how he found out, through the, through the mail. There was no Facebook groups, there was no online petitioning. It was like 1940 something. And, uh, the, for, and I don't, it wasn't the League of Nations, but it was the United Nations. And the, they, there was a youth version of the United Nations that was being founded by some 19-year-old kid somewhere else in the United States. I have no idea how Don found out about this guy. They weren't Facebook friends, I'll tell you that much. Uh, and uh, he mailed him, and they got together this group of 20 or 30 uh, young uh, activist types and created the youth version of the United Nations. And it was all managed through snail mail. <laughs> and I think they had a convening or two over the course of several years. Um, and it, but it was incredibly powerful uh, that that was happening, uh, given all of the constraints. Uh, regardless of the constraints, it's incredible that that happened and that he was a part of that. And so from the very beginning, he was act, he had activism of sorts in his blood. And all of the, yeah. <laughs> and all of the, I mean, again, all of the asylum cases, uh, all of the refugees he stood up for, all of the. Uh, all of the work he did in, in academia for social change and, and social theory, um, just everything that he was doing was, uh, was, was projective in a certain way, but to, to, to decide uh, in his early years as an, Aikido, as an Aikidoka that, hey, I see a problem, which is that there's a lot of people that love to apply Aiki principles in their daily lives but I'm not seeing a lot that's joining these people across borders uh, all around the world as part of a singular association. Maybe I'll found an organization to enable that to happen, to create a platform for that to occur um, and build an association there. That's projective. I think to, if, if, one, if he were to have limited himself to the idea of receptive Aikido only, as there's only Nage and Uke will you know, attack Nage insofar as Nage neutralizes the attack and then we just start the next thing. Uh, but that I'm not actually gonna create the attack toward a problem that I see, then uh, I don't know if this organization would have ever been founded. Uh, and so I think that there's just something really powerful to be said for projective Aikido um, in social change. And the same thing is true of Money Think. The same thing is true of any great organization, yeah. <laughs> The same thing is true of any great organization, uh, which is that uh, if you look at the kind of, I, I think, there's incremental change and there's exponential change. Uh, and there are a lot of organizations that have achieved a lot through incremental change, but with the kind of technology we have now, with the kind of, uh, I mean, for transportation, for communication, all kinds of technology, body-mind technology that this, secret group of people has discovered. Um, the, there, the potential is so much more unlimited than uh, we might even give ourselves uh, the, the permission to acknowledge on a daily basis. That, you know, 
the reason that there are that there are still starving people in the world, the reason that people still get polio, the reason that malaria still kills millions and millions of people each year, that two billion people don't have clean drinking water, is that incremental solutions have not worked. And so if we're going to be the change agents that we have the unique resources and experiences to be, we have to think about exponential solutions. And projective Aikido, I think, is a, a powerful foundation upon which to think about those kinds of solutions. Because it doesn't state that anything has to happen in order for us to take a step forward. It just, ha it just states that things have to be a certain way that makes us stir inside. And that we already have everything we need to initiate that, that first grab. Um, the, the, final, um, the final piece here is mediative Aikido. And I actually don't, I thought about this a lot, and um, on, outside of the work of mediation itself, uh, I don't know uh, that um, I have a, a really literal, tangible way to think about mediative Aikido. That's more of like a, a question I would pose. But um, I do think philosophically, mediative Aikido has been really powerful for thinking about our organization as a mediative force in the world. Uh, in the same way that Aiki Extensions is, in the same way that anyone doing powerful work at a, at, in, you know, on the fringes between two uh, forces in the world that are, that are at tension with each other, uh, uh, business and the social sector, uh, po uh, everything in politics, um, uh, uh, gentrified communities, uh, wherever you're, whatever you're looking at, wherever you're operating, there are tensions. Uh, and I think that uh, the reason that our organization has been successful is because we've been monomaniacally obsessed with, uh, with uh, neutralizing the, the conflict at those, in, that those tense intersections and not just neutralizing and letting, and letting it sit and disappear, but neutralizing it and creating these vortices that, uh, that speed up the flow of resources and dialogue and information at those points of intersection. So I'll give two examples. One is just, uh, it, you know, when you're building a nonprofit, there's the philanthropy that happens meaning the, the money that's coming in from wealthy people that don't have a lot of exposure to the students or the patients or whomever you're serving. And then there's the students or the patients or whomever you're serving, the beneficiaries. Those two parties rarely come into any kind of genuine, deep empathy with one another. And so if you're the social change agent that's trying to grow the pie that is funneling resources in some kind of smart, strategic way between these two entities in the world or the universe, then the job is not to tear down the machine. The, the job is not to, uh, to say, you know, the, the, I mean, in our experience, the corrupt and wealthy are, uh, the, the big banks are ruining the communities. If we were to go, if I was to go into a meeting with J.P. Morgan Chase's foundation and say, you're ruining our communities, they would not write us a check for a million dollars. They would not give us a chance to actually do the work that they're, not, they're never going to be equipped to do because they don't have the claim to authenticity or the trust in the community to actually affect the change that's needed. Uh, but if we go in and we say, look, we understand that there are, uh, there are difficulties uh, that our communities face, some of which are exacerbated by your institution, some of which are, uh, you know, possibly uh, able to be alleviated by things that your institution can do. Let's figure out a way to partner and move past whatever differences we have. And at this point, it's like you go into these conversations. Maybe there aren't even any differences that are even worth acknowledging. At a certain point, it's like. You talk to the people in the companies that work in the foundation, they care. They came from nonprofits. They didn't, they're, I mean, a lot of them now aren't getting transferred from marketing departments to, and they have no sense of what's happening. These are just people. They're everyday people. You're not going to, I'm meeting with J.P. Morgan Chase. That's why I'm ranting, but I'm not meeting with J.P. Morgan Chase. I'm meeting with Colleen, who has a family, who has this narrative, who has this story, and we're talking. 
and we're sitting down and we, I, we move the table out of the way because there's just two humans and we're just looking for a partnership opportunity to improve another group of humans situation and that's it and and there's nothing more than that uh, and so I, I you know when I see people tying themselves to airplanes and trees to tell British Petroleum to <clears throat> stop ruining the environment I kind of think you're you know you're destroying your case because uh, no one at British Petroleum is going to be interested no one's going to respect what you have to say if you're disrespecting you know what they what they have to be doing anyway. It's not like they, they, you know, people don't choose to go into a career where they're, you know, uh, ruining communities or people's health or anything like that. They're just, you know, need to get a job, need to help my family. So if you're on the activist side, it is what it is. Find a way to work together. Um, mediated by keto. Uh, so that's, uh, those are the four, uh, the four pillars that Don distilled uh, for on the mat training and how they've been really helpful uh, for me off the mat in social change efforts and I think that each of us as a change agent in whatever capacity uh, can uh, perhaps find find some value in applying them in our everyday lives uh, so again thank you for having me and um, I don't know what time it is but that if, if the dialogue is of interest then I, I certainly mentioned dialogue is of interest, but let me first say thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a of hands of anyone who didn't find something inspiring in what you just heard. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right. That's right, yeah. Really Could I ask a general question? Is is that speech uh, available somewhere? Uh, I, I just Don's videotaped speech. it. So. The Don speech. The Don speech. I'm oh, oh. About. Good question. No offense, but no, you're no, very, no, very no, well spoken no, young man. Yes. Knowing Don, I'm sure he wrote it up. As, we have the written copy. Yeah. We, I, I think we do. We yeah. have it on the website. Uh, now it'd be yeah, great to make that available on the website. Um, if you're a member, you can access it. Uh, but we can certainly circulate it. So go. Mm. When are you running for president? <laughs> Not until he's 35, that's the rule. Yeah. Well, we're going to be like this. Got to produce my birth certificate. Well said. <laughs> yeah. And how long is it? You want to come up here? Yeah, bring yeah. him up. Come bring him up. Bring him up. Please. How long has it been since you've trained? Uh, uh, three months. Maybe. Okay. Three months, and then it was about four months before that. Okay. We'll all be happy to throw you around. Yeah, we're happy to throw you. We're just we're just getting to to a point of stability. Yeah. We just moved to the U.S. a month ago. Like that. Just yeah. got married. Got married two weeks ago. Oh, wow. And busy time. Where are you living? In Hyde Park. Hyde Park. Yeah. Are you going to university then? Uh, went to the university before, but um, <clears throat> we we have uh, office space very close to the university for the nonprofit. You near Don's old house. Actually, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, we yeah. just moved in. That's a good year. Four, four or five blocks away. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah, yeah that's a good. That's cool. Thank you. Uh -huh. Indeed, Indeed, your neighborhood. Yeah. What's the next thing to like? Um, I think. <laughs> right. Um. So I was telling Robert that uh, yeah. traditionally at this stage in an organization. It's called uh, the Valley of Death because you're past the initial phase where all of the big funders want to fund the next big thing, and the new thing, and the, the darling of the field. Um, and, but you're not at the point yet where uh, Pew Research Institute or Harvard, Harvard Business School has, uh, <laughs> uh, has said, you know, on, at the national stage, we have six years of data longitudinally proving that this is what causes revolutionary right. student outcomes. So we're kind of in this middle phase where we have really strong data of our own, but we have to find a kind of a group of core right. philanthropists that can help us bridge the next couple of years right. until we get to that point. Um, that doesn't sound so. negative. Yeah, that's how working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, recruiting a strong team is a core part of that because yes. serious donors want to meet who's leading the organization. Uh, 
uh, it doesn't always work to say yeah. we've got a 26 year old CEO that <laughs> has been doing it for eight years. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I need a belt like that. That'll be <laughs> that would make the meeting. Yeah. Oh, so, with a philanthropist, yes. Yeah. 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 Hi, I mean, but this is Maximilian. Right. <laughs> Don't you want to fund this kid? You know, <laughs> um, besides the fact that my dojo, when I found it, is going to have a thought board somewhere where like, everyone at least once a month has to write something up that came to them while they were on the mat. Yeah. And then cool. everybody in the dojo is going to have like a little chop, you know, and I don't know how to do a chop with a whiteboard exactly, but you know, where you can go like, you know, sort of a thumbs up way of, of huh. sort of, um, and as sensei, you know, I'm going to pick the weird idea or the, you know, the person may not be getting the validation from all the other check marks, you know? Yeah. Um, but that seems like a really good way to seed the conversations down at the pub. Love that idea. You know? Yeah. Uh, and everybody, you know, it, it makes sense that, that mine shouldn't be the only dojo doing that. Um, the, I was also reminded of, uh, what was his name, Sutton, the, the bank robber? That's where the money is. Yeah. Uh -huh. You go to JP Morgan Chase for the money because that's where the money is. And how right it is to figure out a way to make that work. Right, and of course there's a line. If J, I mean, it's interesting, you know, um, people that have only been on kind of the uh, really hardcore activist, like canvassing labor advocacy side of things, where it's always a conflict and there's never anything except for uh, uh, terms of terms of temporary agreement, but we're still enemies, that kind of thing. People that I talk to that are from that mode of activism. Will uh, will always ask kind of cynically, well, what is J.P. Morgan Chase making you do in order to give you this money? Like, are you pushing predatory products on like poor kids? And I'm like, no, no, of course we're like, you know how terrible that would be for J.P. Morgan Chase. Like the second a reporter found out if if you know attached as a stipulation to every grant agreement that like the nonprofit that means well must like secretly screw over all of their beneficiaries. That's like an end to J.P. Morgan Chase. They don't need more PR nightmares than they already have. So uh, for them, it's, you know. Uh, oh, wow, oh, we heard that. Ouch, ouch, that was a big alley. It's the same story of my idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think, you know, for them. Court, big alley. Yep. <laughs> Spear. Oh, wow. first real attack. <laughs> I have some people to introduce you to. Hey, wonderful, thank you. Yeah. I would love to. Um, some, of the, some of the people that I, I learned um, precisely what you're proposing um, are, are, know it because they were fill my body on the real doctor for 30 mm. years or whatever. Yeah. And uh, the question is, like in any Aikido, the question is when to do which tactic. And right. There's no such thing as an, Ill, an, an, an illegitimate tactic. Sure. They're all right. understandable given a certain set of circumstances, yep. and do you, you only get results uh, to, to some, just sometimes by chaining yourself to something. If the chaining yourself to something does that actually has the result that's the thing you wanted, you do that, you right. figure out where it goes, and you decide whether you want to do it again or not. Because um, there's all kinds of benefits to doing that that are not about getting the agreement from the bank that did, in fact, put stipulations on everything to screw over the people that for sure. like 40 years up to the point that people wouldn't change themselves to something yeah. over it. So I mean, it's not, you know. Yeah, I'd love, I'd, I'd, I would love to debate it. I would love to debate it because I think that um, although in, in theory I love that, I wonder how much history tells a story of success that happened accidentally uh, as a byproduct of, or successes, like social change successes that happened um, in spite of uh, tactics that seemed to have produced results and then are credited the results after the fact when sure. really a lot of the important work was happening in back rooms. But I, I do, I, it's interesting. I don't, I don't know, it, it, like, and I'd love to trace the line. Made possible. Maybe line. the back rooms yeah, were made possible, possible because the of the outcome. The dilemma is that it's not, it's not ever, since we don't know what happened in the back rooms, sure. and getting, the, getting through the narrative to the actual facts that this happened first and then that and then that, so many things in complex systems happen at the same time. Mm. You, you can pretty much pick your narrative when you're deciding 
you know, which thing was a prerequisite and mm -hmm. which thing happened to be happening at the same time and all that yeah. stuff. And the only place I've been able to get real data from that is as many points of the people that were actually involved with it as possible. Sure. Yeah. And the union organizers are actually the ones that are willing to admit, like right off the bat, a lot of the time, it was absolutely a synergy of just what was going on at the same time. And that thing we did, that wild hair thing, was really cool because of PR, but really cost us in the back room and we wouldn't do that again. And yeah. They get yeah. really specific about it because yeah. it's their bread and butter. It's, totally. it's their thing. And they're as serious about it as the JP Morgan people who are just going to work. Sure. Just, take, just take care of the thing. Yeah. You know, but sometimes, Very interesting. Yeah, sometimes you'll never, ever get rid of me. I'm so glad you guys made that awesome decision this time. And I'm going to be here again next week. And it's not that I dislike you, it's that when you don't speak truth to power, there isn't anybody to do it, and we're the only ones doing it at the moment. Mm -hmm. Power does weird shit to people, mm -hmm. and I would like for it not to be you or me. So let's just keep the relationship going, because right. I'm never, ever going away. So I'm never gonna be gone. Right. I'm gonna be knocking on your door. It's all my time. job. Yes, but I'm gonna bring it in. <laughs> yeah. Hi, how's it going? How's that, how's that corporate record going? Right. You know, right. I'm gonna be here next week, I'm gonna be here next month. And there are the people chained to your front door, and hi, here's the mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely, you can't get rid of that sector. Mm -hmm. They're just gonna keep doing it. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it satisfies something, that, that response to the frustration of growing up with nothing. Right. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I, I think... Uh, That's the only thing I wanted to challenge you about during the whole talk, really. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. That's, yeah. I, th I think, uh, I, I mean, very well said, you're right. Uh, when, the, when. Sometimes, sometimes that's accurate and sometimes not. <coughs> yeah, weird. sometimes you have to scorch the earth. <laughs> uh, not very often, I don't. No. No, sometimes you have to put your body on the line to make your point. Because you do not get taken seriously until you put your body on the line. And there are two, again, are you trying to raise funds for a program or are you trying to change public policy? as in a war or brutality or some pattern of abuse. Those are two different types of issues. Yeah. And the you are evil people approach doesn't really work very well in my experience, but no. the we, we will overcome, we will never go away, this is yeah. gonna keep going on and on and on thing. Right. Uh, it's really, it, it's- You can't, you, know, you don't negotiate your way to, lack, to abolition. Mm -hmm. You don't negotiate your way to suffrage, okay? Yeah. That because that's not a negotiation for philanthropy. That is not philanthropy, that's civil rights. Mm -hmm. yeah, and very and different. that's the very difference. Different. Yeah. 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 Yes. Very yes. different. Yes. As you walk yes. up to the two people on the subway, you can walk up and flatten one of them, or you can walk up and just be there and squat. Right, well, right, and that's the escalation. And and de-escalation right. works. De-escalation mm. works. But what's but again? What is your what is the goal, and how are you going to achieve that goal? Right. But Don Don yeah. was was as far as projected by Guido is concerned, he was he wasn't fearless. Um, he 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 was pretty straightforward about having some serious concerns about some things, sure. some choices in his life. Sure. But he was he was extremely direct about some some things. Yeah, yeah. And then he would negotiate. He I mean, he was available to negotiate. Sure. But the beginning was a Remy, a Temi, and then, and then as soon as everyone was clear that he wasn't going anywhere, mm -hmm. then the negotiations could begin. Mm -hmm. I saw him do that several times, and he was really good at that. It's the, it's he the was hit strong. the mule over the really head strong. with a two by four approach. Yeah. And you have his attention. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I thought it was pretty significant that you referenced the strategic nature of Ike in your um, yeah. in your play. Um, I, I've also witnessed the strategic the application of Ike to the strategic awareness in, in companies and organizations. And I think we touch it very lightly here, but it needs a lot more light. Um, the, I could say the Aikido that I've seen leaders do and large systems has been amazing. Um, uh, I'll give you a quick example. The, I was working with Kaiser, and uh, the guy who was in charge of their uh, software factory and their upfront client interface, uh, in charge of both, took the role to run one of these shops, 
And he called me up one day and said, hey, Thorson, I think I got this Aikido shit you've been talking about. <laughs> what did you do, Dave? He said, well, there's been this chronic conflict between these two operations. Once the year starts, whose budget does the new work come out of that we didn't count on? And we fight all year long, every year, all year long, about whose budget the new work's gonna come out of. So what I did was I gave the front end the software budget. I said, you what? I said, I gave them the software budget. It's like, I don't know how many million dollars. This is IT at Kaiser, it's 5,000 people. He's got this, I gave him my budget. He said, I get it. You give up control to gain influence. Mm -hmm. Strategic awareness and IQ, just fabulous stuff. Oh, and I, I, I know that's what you were hitting. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I, wish they, I wish Kaiser had handled the negotiation with the union that way. <laughs> yeah. That would have been over in a real way, so much faster. Mm -hmm. All right, so, okay, yes, there's the budget. Let us know how we should protect one, one thing that uh, that reminds me of this, this story about Kaiser and control and influence is a um, uh, major change we've made recently to most of our operating model, which is uh, that for basically since the beginning, we were building chapters uh, in communities kind of from the ground up, grassroots chapters of college volunteers working in the schools. And we're still doing that, and we just had our biggest year yet. Um, but uh, in order to get to the level of scale that we want to get to, we have started to find that actually licensing parts of our curriculum and our technology to other organizations and training other organizations, which is, isn't a new a novel concept in any way, um, could be much, much more uh, impactful in the long run for what we're trying to do, but similarly it gives up a lot of control over our operation because what we used to think was our strategic advantage to achieving our envision was that we would build the distribution system as well as the production system and we would just manage them simultaneously and because we had our own distribution channels, we would just shoot out the curriculum and everything through there until we realized that our distribution channels basically cap out at like 40,000 students. Uh, and there are 19 million students in the year 2030 that we wanna be in touch with. And so the only way that we actually get to any reasonable, a reasonably high amount of scale is through partnerships. Uh, but that gives up a lot, a lot, a lot of control because it's not our volunteers anymore. It's the caseworkers at the uh, Department of Health and Human Services of New York City. It's, you know, so. Is that decision made, or are you working on it right now? Um, it's it's pretty much made, um, but uh, they're happening simultaneously. So this whole volunteer base we've built, we're going to slow down growth on, but maintain and keep it as kind of a testing lab for new products and services. So we'll still be running. Do you guys? Do you guys create like a phone app that? the students end up using as part of the curriculum that teaches them how? Yeah, so now over half of our staff is technology. So mm -hmm. engineers, designers, product managers, um, and the, you know, for a while we were outsourcing all of our technology development to another firm, and this is the opposite situation where we actually needed more control in order to be as effective as we wanted to be. When you say half of our staff, you need five people? Uh, yeah, five people and five other ten. four more contractors. That's a lot. Yeah. Go. Are the schools that do this, Chicago's obviously the first, are the 30 schools you mentioned all similar in size and reputation? Or are they, you know, a range or are they, did you target schools by that have resident poverty populations nearby? Yeah. At first, it was based on do you have high quality volunteers in dense concentration in an urban center near a, a geography of poverty. Um, but we weren't super deliberate about the specific conditions. Now it's much more, um, are you directly next to an area where over 80% of the students are on free or reduced price lunch? Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, do you have local census data to back up the fact that you, sh you can justify having a volunteer chapter in that region. 
and then the, but the volunteer quality has to be high. So we, even though it's, it's, um, po it's very possible to find great volunteers at large state schools, the barriers to entry for admission are lower. And so um, it takes a lot more effort to find and train volunteers that are kind of ready to go uh, out of the gate. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're trying to figure out how we can streamline the strategy a little more. So do you just sort of like look at the U.S. News and World Report and pick from the top 50 or? Yeah, it's, it's at this point it's more like inbound. So if, if we have, it, it, you know, to be totally honest, it's determined by funder interest at this point. Okay. So if we have a major 